Hey, so today we are going to watch together a mini documentary from Bloomberg that speak about how a bunch of traders made 660 million US dollar when the oil went negative. I, I want to make that kind of money, so <laughs> let's check how they did that. On April 20th, oil markets did something they never had before and they crashed, went into negative territory and closed the day at minus $40. Meanwhile, uh, in a place uh, called Thaden Boyce in Essex. Thaden Boyce in Essex. <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> Who are those people? A group of nine traders led by a guy called Cuddles made $660 million over the course of a couple of hours. The price of oil has collapsed to a record low. We've never really seen anything like it. WTI this morning down more than 35%. People maybe wouldn't have been so surprised if the oil price had fallen to zero, but the oil price went to minus 38. It went far lower than anyone had expected. And so lots of people in the market were saying, well, hang on, something else is going on here. A couple of months later, I started to get wind through a kind of network of sources that a tiny firm in the outskirts of London had made a huge amount of money that day, had potentially had some part to play in what happened. The information we got was that nine traders at Vega Capital London had made in the region of $660 million in one day. As a group, I think they made as much money in one day as Apple makes from its international sales in one day. I mean, it's an insane sum of money. Did they pull off a fantastic trade? Did they predict the way the market was moving and get it absolutely right? Or was there something else going on and had they actually done something that breached market rules in a bid to, to sort of push the market? And that investigation is, is ongoing. Yo man, so uh, yeah, I didn't know about this story. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see man. that's a lot of money but i like the way they phrase it like uh did they break the market rule what the f market rule man <laughs> it, it's it's a commodity so uh, um I, there's no inside trading in commodities i, I don't know that <laughs> so let's see if they broke any market rule <laughs> So Paul Commons is uh, a trader who cut his teeth in, in the pits in the, the 80s and 90s. When everyone had a nickname, his was Cuddles. If you can imagine, that was a very sort of cutthroat type of world where people are doing, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars trades by shouting at each other, giving hand signals and then sort of scrawling on scraps of paper. I would have loved to see this in, in action, you know, at the heyday. I mean, this is, <laughs> if you remove the sound and, and you just look at them, it sounds like a bunch of maniac that do sign, I mean, so real, so real. The culture of the trading pits in London was very influenced by uh, the, the working class guys who became traders there. They weren't like the city bankers that had gone before them. They weren't usually Oxford or Cambridge. You know, they didn't wear Savile Row suits. They were ordinary working guys who happened to have a talent for trading. And a lot of them came from Essex. I think it was 400 traders in the pits and Cuddles in his you know, oil and gas pit was uh, described to us as amongst the top three among, you know, in amongst that, was very successful and, and made you know, very large amounts of money as a, as a young man. But you know, inevitably, uh, mechanization and the arrival of electronic markets um, was the kind of death knell for the pits. And in 2005, the IPE closed down. And when the pits shut down, uh, a lot of the traders who worked there lost their jobs or quit or went to work for financial institutions. But Paul Commons decided to start his own trading collective out in Essex. Some of them are ex-pit guys, cut from the same cloth as him. Lots of them are actually sort of in their 20s and they're his, you know, drinking buddy's son or they're his own kid's friends from football. You know, they're, they're young lads, hungry and ambitious, and he brings them into the fold. I love this British role, the young lads. Hey, lads. <laughs> and fairly shortly, he's got, um, you know, maybe a dozen or so traders that are, they're independent let's be clear but they're all part of this collective <laughs> <laughs> yeah
Yeah, let, I'll let Liam deal with Essex. I am from Essex, so I feel like I'm free to, uh, you know, to, <laughs> to get into this. Sweet, as they say. If you were to ask someone in Britain how they would imagine a, a kind of Essex person, they would see someone who's maybe so, slightly flamboyant, with a, a sort of Cockney accent, a sort of Guy Ritchie-style accent. <laughs> you know, not afraid to splash the cash, but it's probably pretty bright and has done well for themselves. Don't even make sense, does it? But, you know, these guys, they drove around very nice Rolls Royces and Bentleys. They went to uh, places like Marbella on holiday. <laughs> and there's like so many British on Marbella. And <laughs> you know, it's funny because Marbella, it, it's not posh. I mean, this is, this is like second zone for, for vacation. It's not like <laughs> the, the, the British thing that this is a nice place to go on the holiday. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thaden Voice is a very wealthy place. You have to have a considerable income to be able to afford to live in that village. It's a really nice place to live, and it's 20 minutes to tube ride away from the city. Earlier in the summer, we have this lead, which is that there's this tiny firm called Vega Capital London, and they were the biggest winners from the biggest oil crash in history. You know, anyone that covers markets is going to be surprised about that. You know, you're thinking your BPs of the world or your Glencores, but it's this tiny firm. And one of the big challenges that we had was actually finding out who worked with Vega Capital. It wasn't immediately obvious, and at first we had absolutely no idea. Uh, if you go to the Vega Capital website, it says it's under construction. If you do basic online searching, it's very difficult to find anyone who's publicly connected to the company. So inevitably, we're incredibly curious at this point. Who the hell are these people? The more reporting we did, the more it became clear that this group were connected socially as well as professionally. They went to weddings together, they played golf together, they would go on holiday together. We found out that a number of them were members of the West Ham Supporters Club in London. A few of them started companies together, so you could see all the connections between them and start to see a distinct group emerging. And it really just was was this kind of shock that, you know, this wasn't just like a hedge fund or a firm you'd never heard of. This was actually a group of buddies who all had the same experience on this day and had all made a huge amount of money. Yeah, so um, about that, so uh, those guys are not, from what I see, they are not physical commodity traders. They are pure speculator. And uh, I guess what they are is proprietary traders. So that's mean that uh, they use their own money to trade. The difference usually is like a hedge fund. They use um, capital from outside investors and so on, and they have a fund structures that um, I mean they need to do a lot of a lot of reporting and so on. But in the case of prop traders, um, I mean this is uh, usually the, the people's money, I mean the, or the partners' money. So um, they can do pretty much whatever they want with the money. Uh, as long as they don't have to, I mean, as they don't have to report with uh, to any type of uh, uh, LPs or, and I think depending on their structure, they can really do whatever they want with <laughs> with the money, which is not the case with a uh, hedge fund. And also, at hedge fund, you need to understand that uh, hedge funds have clients, and if you have like really really poor um, performance over the month, month over month, then the clients will withdraw the money. Uh, that always happens, even though having poor performance is a part of the strategy and when something big happens, you make a lot of money. Uh, having like a poor performance, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's bad. But with a prop trader, I mean, you can have a strategy that loses money over like years and years if you know that when something happens, you will make like 100 like that. So uh, anyway. So if you're an oil trader, there's a number of different ways you can trade and, and probably the most popular is WTI futures contracts. And it's basically a contract that says, I'm going to buy a thousand barrels of oil from you at this point in the future, or I'm going to sell a thousand barrels of oil to you at this point in the future. It's actually just a financial contract to gamble on to predict whether oil is going to go up or down. Okay, it's a financial contract to gamble on if you buy or sell it as a pure speculator but if you use it to edge yourself like the other market participant or the physical participant then it's not gambling it's just uh, edging, edging your sales or your purchase so um, it's a gambling if you speculate with no physical part of the leg on the 20th of april in essex 
There have been signals for a while that this was going to be an exceptional day in oil markets. And we know that some of them arose early and started their trading in the early hours of the morning while it was still dark outside. Essentially what they were doing is buying contracts that gave them uh, an obligation to buy oil at whatever the price ended up at 2.30 p.m. So they're basically placing a bet that oil was going to fall throughout the day. But they're simultaneously selling lots of oil as well. And that whether they make a profit and how much profit they make is the difference between what they buy the oil for and what they sell the oil for. Now, of course, we now know throughout uh, April 20th, the price dropped and dropped. So this is going very well for them. You know, they are committed to selling oil at these prices and the prices are continuing to fall, which means they're going to be able to offset it and buy oil at cheaper at the end of the day. Now, once it gets to kind of one third, so um, I guess what the, uh, they are referring is that they are just um, buying option. Oh, that's pretty much what they are trading. The 2 p.m. That's when things start to get really interesting. Suddenly, there's a kind of influx of, of buyers and sellers. You know, as desperation increases in the market and trading volumes go up. Now, at 2:08 p.m. exactly, something bizarre and unprecedented happened which is that oil passes into negative territory. And it fell to a record level of minus $38. We've never seen anything like it, period, in terms of the contraction uh, of the global economy. That huge gulf between what they were buying the oil for and what they were selling it for enabled them to make more money than they ever thought possible. So their profit was the difference between minus 37 and all of these positive numbers on every contract they sold. The price of crude briefly hit minus $37 a barrel. For one group of traders operating from a small office, it was a very, very profitable day. It's important to remember this, this had never happened before in the history of oil trading. No one could have predicted it. I can't think of another example of where you enter a trade and you get paid on both sides. You get paid both to sell and to buy. It, you know, it's unthinkable. One thing we know about uh, the Cuddles Trading Arcade is that they were very comfortable taking large risks. And, it, it, you know, you have to be clear, this was a large risk. Yeah, we spoke to oil traders, both people that know these guys and people that don't, and they all say that this is, you know, incredibly risky. And that's actually what stops a lot of oil traders doing trading like this. They simply aren't willing to stomach the risk. But Cuddles and his friends were. So when the... Yeah, so, um, and I think this is why, uh, this is one reason when I said that uh, those guys are prop traders, like they can take some maximum risk uh, as long as this is your money. You can imagine that if you run a hedge fund, it's your client's money. So if you are making, I don't know, it's a good day, you're making a bunch of money, whatever, then you will cut your position and limit your downside risk. Because you're the, oh, look, I've done enough money for my clients, I don't need to risk more to make more. Uh, which is not the case with prop traders, so, um, yeah. Kind of final calculations came down. The group of the nine most profitable traders made $660 million or thereabouts between them. I mean, if you can imagine, I think three or four of them made in excess of 100 million each. <laughs> one of these. 100 million in one day. <laughs> what the f <laughs> Astonishing things about this trade is that two of the individuals who made more than $100 million in a single day were in their 20s. One of them was 22 years old. You know, only a few years earlier, he'd been posting on his social media about doing teenage stuff with his mates in town and going to see girls and rap music. And here he is a few years later making $100 million in a single day's trading. When me and Liam discovered that, we were just, we couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, it pays to, uh, I mean, uh, obviously what happened is a bit like uh, the jackpot, you know, when you play on the machine, you know, when you get involved, I mean, sometimes you get lucky. And the fact that they were maybe so young, they did not know uh, what more experienced uh, traders knew. They took massive risk and it paid off. Oil trading is a, is a zero-sum game. Anytime you're making money as an oil trader, someone else is losing it. Amongst the what is speaking that this is a zero-sum game, it's true uh, for what they are doing. Uh, they are pure speculators. But in, in the case of physical commodity traders, you know, they have buyers, they have sellers, they have clients, they need to deliver the good to a certain place. They take off their counterparty 
the risk, to take the risk on them, and they fulfill a quite important role in the global supply chain, which is not really the case for people that just speculate on the screen. This is why, personally, I, I mean, I can't do that, you know, being like all day long in front of screen, like that being a numbers, I, mean, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not paid for that type of job. Some people are. The biggest losers were the investors in this Chinese fund, crude oil treasure fund, um, there were thousands of them and they lost everything. Lots of people had put their savings into oil funds. They lost money that day. Uh, big banks and brokers who sort of stand in the middle of trading parties, they lost money that day. And another interesting thing is that oil producing countries like Kuwait or Canada, um, they sell oil as, as a, an average of the WTI closing price over the preceding month. So the fact that one of those numbers in the average was minus 37 meant, if you can imagine, countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait potentially lost a couple of dollars on every single barrel of oil they sold that month. Vega Capital's traders made such an extraordinary sum of money that it was inevitable there would be some scrutiny of what they did. But it wasn't just the sums of money they made. In the vital half an hour before the settlement price was set, they were by far the biggest sellers of oil futures in the market, which is an incredible thing to think about when you consider that the other participants in that oil market are going to be the world's biggest banks, you know, oil majors, BP and Shell, and here you have a group of nine guys in Essex who are having this significant influence over a global market for oil. I mean, I think you have to assume that if these guys have made seven million or ten million dollars, they probably would be celebrating in Essex right now. But the fact that they made closer to seven hundred million has meant that they are facing understandable scrutiny. We wrote individually to uh, all the all the Vega traders who did exceptionally well that day, and we got a, a letter in response from a law firm who, representing the group. Uh, the law firm was at pains to point out, number one, that they haven't been accused of any wrongdoing, um, that they all traded independently and separately, and they'd basically all made up their own minds that this was what was going to happen in oil markets based on publicly available knowledge, and decided to execute this trade. Yeah, so this is funny because what the lawyer said, uh, point number three, I guess the lawyer was afraid that there could be like some type of um, uh, inside trade possible at that or that their clients will be facing that. But again, there is no inside trade possible in commodity trading. What I love about these stories is there's a real variance of opinion and some people will look at what happened and think that must be dodgy. They all traded at the end of the day. They all made a huge amount of money while all these people lost. That's shocking. But lots of people say these guys are at acute disadvantage. They're in a market that's inhabited by, you know, huge technology driven funds and firms and oil giants that have got all the advantages in the world and when you get a bunch of Essex geezers who essentially beat the market and find a way to make a huge amount of money they should get a pat on the back really because that's the dream. Since this happened a lot of the guys have stopped trading the monthly settlements that they've done so well at in the past. Several of them have set up new companies. They've essentially gone very quiet. You know, any kind of social media presence they had is, is, is kind of closed down. By all accounts, they're, you know, waiting this out. It's certainly too early to try and predict how the regulatory investigations are going to pan out. You know, we just don't know. There's a number of potential outcomes for these guys. You know, potential punishments, if there are any findings of manipulation against Vega or anyone affiliated with it, might be you could be fined, uh, you could be banned from trading, and you know, in the most extreme cases, there have even been criminal prosecutions in the past of, uh, of people who have been found to have been manipulating the settlement and uh, misconduct related to, to trade at settlement. There are other outcomes too. Uh, yes, so few thought about that. It's funny because um, for those guys, yeah, obviously this is quite dicey for them because they can get like a, a destroy <laughs> if uh, we found out that they did uh, something uh, illegal. But um, because you know this is only nine guys and they have no leverage whatsoever on the, the market and and so on. But when we find that a huge player did something extremely stupid and screw up the market like it happened um, on the nickel market uh, with the, the, the Chinese um, mogul. 
for whatever reason, when this is a big a billionaire that has a big connection uh, in government and so on, then the, the, the rules change for him. But when this is a bunch of guys from Essex, <laughs> I'm not really sure that they have the leverage to make uh, the, the rules <laughs> bend for them. You know, one, one obvious one is going to be they're able to walk away from this life-changing trade with all the money that they made and celebrated as heroes in the trading community. They, you know, they'll go down as legends. So guys, what do you think? What do you think about it? Do you think that uh, it's unfair that uh, some people were able to make so much money uh, in a so short uh, a period of time? Or um, do you think that, no, um, props to them and they, they beat the market and they, they, made, they made a lot of money. What do you think? I know what I think, but what do you think? Let me know in the comments.